Hello, everyone, and welcome to this latest webinar from IHS Market. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I am Joanne Emery, the Associate Director for Webinar Events for the IHS Market Technology Group, and um, I want to thank you for joining us today. Our webinar is going to be looking at policy-driven analytics and automation for the multi-cloud. Uh, a really uh, important and uh, just innovative uh, topic um, for the today's market for networks and for uh, large enterprises working in this space. And our session today is co-presented by IHS Market and our partner Nuage Networks. Just before we get started with the presentation portion, I want to highlight some features that are available to you on your console. So first, the webinar uh, console that you're looking at can be customized in a number of ways. So you can enlarge the view of your slide area just by clicking on the maximize icon on the top right of the slide area, or just drag the bottom right corner of the window. You can also open, close, or resize any of the windows that you have open on your screen, and you can arrange the console to suit your own preference. At the bottom of the audience console, there are a number of application widgets which contain additional features that are available for you. Make sure you check these out during the webinar. One specific button I do want to call out is the resource list widget. This is the green button that has a document icon on it, and it's where you'll be able to find um, a lot of uh, additional material about today's topic. We have the slide deck that's available for you, and we also have a special companion report with, with more information about today's topic, along with other support material. All these documents can be accessed and downloaded right from your console, so please take advantage of the resources. We also want to make this an interactive session, so we've included a Twitter widget at the bottom of your screen. You can tweet directly from the console, and today we're using a hashtag multi-cloud. And we will have a live Q&A session directly after the presentation, so please submit your questions or comments anytime during the presentation. Just use that Q&A box on the left side of your screen. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, and anything we can't get to on the call, our panel will follow up with you after the webinar. And if you do encounter any technical issues on the webinar, just click the question mark widget and you, you can uh, see uh, answers to frequently asked questions there. And now let me introduce our panel. First of all, leading our discussion, we have Dr. Cliff Grossner. And Cliff is Senior Research Director and Advisor for the Cloud and Data Center Research Practice at IHS Market. Joining Cliff today on the panel is Sunit Chauhan. And Suna is Senior Director for Product Management at Nuage Networks. So a big welcome to the panel, and now let's get started with our presentation. Cliff, let me turn the controls over to you. Well, thank you, Joanne, and welcome everyone uh, who's uh, joined us this morning. We have uh, a pretty exciting topic to discuss, uh, the formation of the multi-cloud, and how SD-WAN is going to drive new requirements for SDN and really bring the requirement that we have a software-defined network all the way from the data center network out to the branch office and to the cloud. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the different markets that are driving this and when and how fast this might go. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about why the current networks, uh, the WAN or even the data center network, really aren't ready and what do we need to do to fix the situation, we'll look at some solutions that are uh, or architectures that can, can solve the problem. And then we'll take a look at some actual success cases uh, that have been su successfully rolled out by our partners from uh, Nuage Networks. Uh, then we'll take a little bit of a look at the actual Nuage Networks uh, products that make the so success stories real and we'll wrap it up with a short conclusion. So with that, let me take a few minutes and share with you IHS Market's perspective on how the market's been unfolding and what we think is gonna happen going forward. While I let everyone know that we've been following both the cloud services market and certainly the uh, software-defined enterprise WAN market uh, since its inception. And so if we go back a little bit in time, just to give us a bit of a marker, we had the phase where the cloud was all about agile computing, and that meant that enterprises needed to think their, rethink their WAN architectures a little bit as the previous architectures or even today's 
traditional architectures, our branch office to corporate and corporate to internet, and we don't really care too much about the cloud that's sort of wrapped into the internet. And 2014 and 2015, we saw the spawning of a lot of interest and investment in rethinking WAN architectures, and software-defined enterprise WAN was kind of born, where we now saw um, SD-WAN solutions that could handle traffic back to corporate from the branch office, of course, but also deal with traffic destined for the cloud and destined for the internet, and potentially do that straight from the branch office to to the cloud. So in fact, moving to more of a one-to-many connectivity versus a one-to-one -one connectivity. The other elements that came along with that were the ability to provide resiliency and virtualize uh, the, tr the um, transport infrastructure across many uh, link types in, in, in transparently to the application. Then in 2016 and 2017, we also saw that enterprises said, you know what, uh, we are now collecting, co connecting to many different cloud service providers. And we need a way to manage our WAN that isn't on a node-to-node -node basis. And so we saw many of the vendors start to deliver the enterprise WAN, but manage from the cloud. And we call that the cloud-delivered enterprise WAN. And as the meta cloud gives way and becomes a multi-cloud, which effectively is a managed version of the meta cloud, where we have managed connectivity with SLA, and we're also able to manage uh, and account all the workloads, no matter where we're computing, whether it's in the enterprise data center, whether it's in one of a cloud service providers data center, and we're also able to layer services on top automatically where we get to the service-oriented enterprise WAN, and that's the phase that I believe we're going to start working on uh, as we transition into 2018, and our survey results certainly show that to us. Now, just so everyone understands that we're not sitting here in our ivory towers and making this up, uh, we have been tracking the uh, launching uh, of the multi-cloud, or meta-cloud now to multi-cloud, for a number of years in our surveys, and we asked North American Enterprise in our most recent survey in August, uh, how many different cloud service providers are you using? And on average, already in North America, that was at eight and expected to grow to 11. Now, this is a mix of IES providers and SaaS providers, but nonetheless, still all very important from a management perspective. And I can tell you that we've asked this question consistently over the last number of years, and we've seen consistent and growing results over the last number of years. So the meta cloud becoming the multi cloud is certainly very real and a very important driver in how WAN network architectures and data center network architectures are rolling out. Now, one of the things that people ask us, you know, is what are the how fast is this going? Where is the cloud services market? And we actually track that very closely and we have off premise cloud services this is revenue to the service providers, be it the large hyperscalers that we all know very well, like Amazon and Google and IBM and Microsoft, and also the telcos offering cloud services. We have that pegged at $343 billion for 2021, growing from uh, around $175 billion in 2017. We have some pretty healthy growth rates, be it for infrastructure as a service in the gray or SaaS in the blue. But the key element that's really exciting is really the movement or the high growth in the platform as a service element, which is being driven by a lot of innovation in artificial intelligence and machine learning and needing to reach out to uh, environments where those are easy to use because there's libraries available or there's hardware available that can accelerate performance. And that's only going to uh, I believe, drive more locations for multi-clouds, having enterprises want to, to compute in more locations, plus specialized locations. So that's strong growth of the multi-cloud as we see in the two middle bands. On top of that, when we look at SD-WAN and the growth there, uh, we also forecast that market, and we forecast that to be $3.3 billion in terms of hardware and software revenue back to the vendors for SD-WAN by 2021. And so again, we're going to see a very significant rollout in SD-WAN, and in fact, I will 
you know, go a little forward and say that I believe that SD-WAN ultimately evolves to become the fabric for the multi-cloud. And this is a very, very strong revenue picture, in part driven by the movement to multi-cloud. Now, the last area that's really important to look at in terms of size and how things are rolling out is we must not forget that the WAN alone can't bring the application performance we're looking for, and it can't be the complete fabric for the multi-cloud. This much, this much, our perspective is we must, re must reach back into the data center, and our forecast for SD -WAN, sorry, SDN in the data center is 18 billion by 2021. Now, a large part of this is for switches in the data center, but also a very significant portion is for software, and that is the light blue that you see, which is around 4 billion in SDN controllers. And so we see ultimately a movement in the market responding to the multi-cloud driver around SDN for the WAN and SDN in the data center. So with that, I'm going to pass uh, the discussion over to my colleague Sunit from uh, New Arch Networks to talk to us about some of the issues in the current data center and WAN networks that they're seeing with their customers and then follow on with how we might solve them. Great. Thank you so much, Cliff. Really glad to be on the webinar with you here. And uh, thanks again for a great summary of where the market currently is and the key trends that are expected to, uh, to shape the networking industry in the near future. Uh, if there was one takeaway for me, it is certainly that the way we are you know, consuming IT services or, or even consumer services, it is fundamentally changing. You know, there's a secular trend towards uh, cloud-hosted services and apps, and we've seen a, a clear impact of that in the wide area network space or the WAN environment. And from a, a technology evolution perspective, uh, we've been on this journey that started with software-defined networking or SCN in the data center. Uh, for the last few years, but uh, challenges obviously remain here. So if you look at the, the present mode of operations as far as networking solutions go, you know, things are still slow to provision and bring up. If you consider a new branch site or, um, uh, for example, you know, just uh, truck rolling things, and it will typically take weeks or months, if not longer, to get all of your routing, switching, and other edge appliances, you know, firewalls and WAN optimization engines in place uh, and properly configured. And uh, it's all manual and highly complex, both from a provisioning uh, as well as day-to-day -day operations perspective. So a majority of times when something does go wrong in the WAN setup, you know, highly skilled technicians are needed to debug and fix those problems. Um, so if you contrast this you know, present mode of operations with the desired mode of operations, the ask has always been for, uh, for agility and automation. Uh, in an ideal state, we want networking services to be configurable on demand from portals, and when things go wrong, uh, we need to not only have the visibility, but, um, but an automated response to those events. And all of this needs to be implemented in a way that complexity uh, is actually replaced by, uh, by simplicity. Now, to be fair, some of this has been achieved in what I call islands of automation. Uh, for example, SDN in the data center is definitely getting to a point uh, or a certain level of maturity now, uh, but the solutions are still limited to certain domains, and, and what we really should be aiming for are those uh, you know, limitless or boundaryless solutions uh, that are not domain-specific. So, so this is when you, when you talk about the multi-cloud vision, that's, um, that's exactly uh, where we need to get to. Um, none of this, of course, is made easier by the constant uh, security threats posed to the networking infrastructure. So if you look at some of the data on this slide, over half a billion records uh, compromised in half a year. Uh, this is the first half 2016 data. Uh, and on, on an average, it took almost 150 days to detect the breach. Um, you know, just consider what happened recently with the, with the Equifax breach and before that the WannaCry uh, ransom bug um, and the heart bleed and the dirty cow, and these are just the ones that have fancy names. Uh, so on one hand, we want that universal connectivity, you know, on-demand access to all of our data and applications, uh, and on the other hand, we have to do it in a way that it is uh, fully secure. Um, now, if you look at the security domain, we often talk about, you know, predicting and preventing uh, threats or, or attacks and then uh, detecting and responding to those threats when they actually happen. Um, the reality is 
that we are still far from the notion of being able to predict and and uh, prevent attacks. If it takes us, you know, half a year on an average to identify a breach, uh, then there is obviously work to be done even on the detection and re uh, response aspects. So the traditional uh, protection models around perimeter security, you know, they don't really lend themselves well to scenarios where once a breach happens, and many times those breaches happen from the inside, uh, the spread of the virus or malware happens laterally, you know, east-west in the data center or from branch to branch over global VPN networks. Um, so not only do we take a long time to de detect, we are not able to quickly react and mitigate or contain the threats. So in the WAN environment, uh, this translates into, you know, what I call branch by branch and box by box approach to applying uh, ACL patches or security patches, and certainly a very manual and slow process. Um, to summarize, you know, there is this huge chasm uh, between the current state and the desired state. So from an overall network solutions or technology perspective, the ask has always been for secure, seamless connectivity that can be enabled by the push of a button. Um, in a highly agile fashion. And what we have today is a patchwork of solutions that are customized for specific domains, specific platforms, and getting all of those to work together leads uh, further to complexity and, and uh, manual intervention, completely defeating all the, you know, all the uh, business cases or TCO models that are used to justify the move to SDN or SD-WAN technology. Um, if you look specifically at the enterprise VPN segment, uh, the goal has been to come up with that on-demand, pay-per-use, uh, self-service model, a consumption model where service providers can offer services on their portal that can be ordered and operational in a matter of uh, uh, minutes and hours, not weeks and months. And truth is that if you go to the online portals for most service providers, the back-end integrations with, you know, even, even with integrations with OSS, BSS systems, there is still a lot of manual and spreadsheet work that is involved. So instead of ordering and getting a service, uh, we are still in that world of um, ordering and uh, waiting for uh, service to be delivered. Uh, so this is where you know next-gen software-defined architectures come in, and that's something I wanted to talk next. But uh, before we do that, I believe there was a there was a poll that he wanted to run at this point. So let me hand it back over to you, Cliff. Well, thank you, Sunit. And um, yes, it is time for us to ask our audience where they are with. Uh, their plans or their organization's plans are to deploy SD-WAN in production. So please let us know. Uh, I'd like to see how this uh, lines up with some of our own data. Uh, some of you may have already implemented or know that you will be implementing in production by 2017. I think that will happen in 2018, 2019, 2020 or later, or no plans to implement. So please take a second click on uh, your response, and then let's see how the audience is done. Okay, wow, so I'm, I'm quite impressed. This is uh, more than I had thought. We have 33% that say they've already implemented SD-WAN in production, and uh, another, 20, another 33% say that they will by 2018, and then one third say no plans to implement. So well, that's an interesting spread between already done it, we're going to do it next year, and no no plans right now. So I guess we have a mix of people that have already do jumped in, and a mix of people that are still wondering about whether or not they they can benefit. So a good audience for the for the call, and also it's a little bit different than um, than our results which were, we did a little earlier this year where we didn't have quite so many people already implemented in our sampling. So good to see the progress from our earlier uh, surveys. So with that, let me turn it back over to Sunit to talk to us a bit about some of the solutions available for uh, federating the data center and WAN to create a fabric for the multi-cloud. Perfect. Sorry, I was on uh, mute there for a minute. Uh, but that was a, that was a great uh, survey result, I, I, and I, uh, I agree with you, uh, Cliff. I think it's a little bit surprising. It could be that the audience uh, uh, that that joined us um, has already kind of jumped into this fray. But uh, nonetheless, you know, if there's one thing that is uh, certainly true in this space is that this uh, this technology is is here to stay. 
Uh, and uh, so what I wanted to do next was take a look at the SD-WAN technology from an architecture perspective and highlight um, how it addresses some of the challenges uh, that we you know, discussed earlier. So for those of you that have already, you know, that are already on this journey, hopefully this provides some validation uh, to to the technologies and the solutions that you are implementing. And those that are still um, in evaluation phase, this will give you some pointers to, you know, when you're running your POCs and RFPs. Um, if I move on to the next slide, uh, the bottom half of this diagram here shows what should be very familiar to folks running MPLS VPN networks, right? Whether you're a large enterprise or a service provider, uh, you know, you have your private L2 or L3 network that provides VPN connectivity across data centers, headquarters, branch sites. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you have the public internet where some of you uh, may have your extranet partner sites or remote branch locations. And traffic between your secure locations on the left traverse uh, the private MPLS, VPLS service. And for any site that is not on the same VPN service, you have the gateway hub at the, uh, gateway at the hub site for internet breakout. Um, in its uh, simplest form, an SD-WAN service um, is an overlay construct that provides uh, this secure, seamless connectivity between users and applications over any kind of transport network, whether it is L2L3 VPN, high-speed internet, and increasingly we are seeing um, 4G LTE networks as well. Uh, and the way we achieve that is through these service overlays, and there are two key architectural layers um, in, in any of these uh, you know, SDN-based solutions. Um, at the top, you have the common policy and analytics plane. So this is what drives the operational improvements by providing a single pane of glass configuration and management versus the, the traditional box-by-box -box or branch-by-branch -branch approach. Uh, and the second layer below that is that horizontally scalable control plane. And this is the layer that manages control information propagation across uh, thousands or tens of thousands of end nodes. Um, now, rarely do we see a scenario where, you know, it's totally a greenfield network. So you really need to plan for a migration strategy. You need to have a plan for, for those brownfield deployments. And one of the deployment approach we've seen there um, is to start with SD-WAN for sites that are connected uh, maybe initially over the Internet and have them connect back to your legacy VPN service at the gateway node or the provider edge router. So in this diagram on the, on the slide that you're seeing, uh, that would be your service overlay number two that is then uh, manually or via, via some script stitched together to your legacy VPN network, which is the service overlay number one uh, at a PE device using VLAN or, or VXLAN uh, handoff. Um, another approach for these brownfield deployments is to have your branch uh, edge CP device connect to two different transport networks say an MPLS VPN on one uplink, an internet another uplink, and depending on the type and destination of the, the application traffic, uh, it can go over one or the other. And the second approach is what we typically refer to as the, as the hybrid SD-WAN solution. Uh, but in any case, independent of the, the migration strategy you choose, the important thing to realize here is that the eventual goal is to create that end-to-end -end service overlay uh, such as the one that is highlighted here uh, with, uh, with the service overlay number three. In fact, uh, if we go back to what Cliff was talking about earlier in terms of the, uh, the you know, multi-cloud uh, evolution, the ideal solution is one that can actually evolve to support that true multi-cloud environment. So your applications uh, may reside on-prem in private data centers, or these are SaaS or public cloud-hosted applications, and users could be accessing these applications from a range of locations over different um, underlay transport networks. Um, depending on the extent of the service overlay, for example, you know, one or two or three in this diagram, uh, the two things that change are the policy enforcement points. So your you know, virtual switch in a hypervisor to a physical switch in a DC fabric to a cloud-hosted uh, uh, switch in AWS providing connectivity to a VPC. So that's one thing that changes. Uh, the other thing that changes is the transport that the service overlay will run over. But the common thing here is the policy and control plane. And this is what enables that agility and the OPEX benefits that we talk about. Um, and, and that's how you, uh, you avoid that islands of automation that we, we talked about earlier. Now, um, in the interest of time here, I don't want to go too far deep into the, you know, the underlying technology pieces, but what you see on this slide is sort of the next click down into that seamless service overlay. 
uh, that can be designed to connect users in branch locations uh, to applications running on-prem in a private data center. Now, this would be the equivalent to the service overlay number one on the prior slide that I was showing. Uh, and a good example here would be you know, scenarios where you have some business critical applications running in a data center that users from all over your global branch locations need to access, um, or perhaps a, a security scenario where smaller branches selectively send traffic to a, to a DC hosted firewall or some scrubbing service. So uh, what you want to do is, you know, the left hand side, uh, which is hosted or data center hosted applications or virtual functions, uh, those are in a secure domain, you know, they are typically unencrypted traffic. You want that to seamlessly be connected to the right hand side, uh, which represents thousands of, uh, hundreds or thousands of branch locations uh, each of them, you know, connecting back to the data center or to each other over these insecure WAN environments using IPsec or Ike, uh, um, Ike tunnels. And what is really needed here is that end-to-end -end policy and control plane uh, that is highly scalable and that eliminates the need for that manual st uh, stitching of the, you know, the traffic flows. So in this picture here, uh, the border router becomes just another data plane enforcement point that is programmed by the, the SDN controller and the, and the policy plane. Um, and this is what stitches the secure DC domain to the insecure WAN domain and effectively lets you write that declarative policy at the top end to do things like selective service chaining uh, without really touching any of these underlay uh, transport nodes. And you can um, theoretically extend the same architecture to public clouds uh, hosted, um, um, hosted applications. Um, so far, I have talked about you know, pushing a uniform configuration and policy from the north uh, to all of these end nodes sitting down south. Uh, but there are a couple of other key considerations here. You know, when you are evaluating SDN or SD-WAN uh, and going forward you know, your net networking technology for the multi-cloud, uh, it's important to pay attention to visibility, and the second thing I'll talk about is the operational uh, aspects. So, from a visibility perspective, you know, with with the SD WAN, SDN technology, we now have the, have this ability uh, to centrally collect massive amounts of data from, you know, tens or hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of end nodes that can provide insight into what is going on in the network. And if if you have the right tools, you can then automatically react to the events in the network. So effectively creating that, um, that full feedback loop that does not require manual intervention. Um, an example of where we've seen this in practice is around creating threshold crossing alarms that can trigger you know, traffic, uh, uh, traffic rerouting or workload quarantining in case something abnormal is detected. Uh, in the security context, it is the same data and analytics information that enables the automated uh, detect and respond aspects that we talked about earlier. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, this also lays uh, the foundation for that uh, predictive analytics that uh, Cliff talked about early on, you know, the use of machine learning and AI tools in the future uh, to, to kind of crunch this data and come up with uh, uh, predictive information. Now, when, um, you know, when it comes to operating these massively distributed SE-WAN networks, uh, it is critical not to forget the underlay network. And there are multiple reasons, but there are two that I, I want to highlight here. Uh, the first has to deal with the quality of experience that customers get from their overlay services. Um, that is 100% tied to the capabilities and characteristics of the underlay networks. So a tunnel is only as good as the underlay infrastructure on which it is traveling. So, so it becomes really important to monitor the underlay network performance and then map the right applications to the appropriate transport. So as a simple example, you know, your voice over IP or business critical applications uh, that require certain delay and jitter characteristics, they possibly still go over your IP VPN or uh, L2 VPN networks while your Facebook and YouTube traffic is uh, sort of offloaded directly to the internet. Um, in many scenarios now, uh, what the edge CP device becomes is, you know, it, it is the device that maps the traffic traversing towards the van um, into the right uh, quality of service buckets. And, and, and we've seen with certain uh, service providers, 
Uh, they are enhancing the capability with the traffic coming from a branch side actually gets mapped to the right, uh, not only to the right uh, transport, but also tagged with the right, key, right queue as well. Um, and the second reason is, uh, you know, the underlay networks are really important when things do go wrong and, and things will, you know, at, at some point there will be failures and you'll need a mechanism to correlate uh, what's going on in the network uh, infrastructure to what's going on in the overlay service, and I'll I'll talk about that in a in a couple of slides. Well, Sunit, I, I'm really happy you're talking about a unified underlay and overlay. Uh, I've been telling all the vendors that would listen to me for several years now that this is very necessary, and it, you know we have some vendors that just ignore the underlay, thinking that they can do it all in the overlay, and I I just seen from many years of experience that. Ultimately, you can't ignore the, the the state of the underlying infrastructure that's delivering the service. So good, good to see that this is coming together. Perfect. Uh, thank you, thank you for that validation, Cliff. And I, I think it's a you know we do get carried away with our own um, sort of um, marketing that the networking industry generates. I, there is value to agility that overlays provide, but then. Um, you know, the services are only as good as uh, as the underlay networks and transport that they run on. And different transports have different characteristics and uh, will, of course, all be used uh, appropriately. Um, so moving on, you know, to summarize, I, I think I have a few charts here that depict the kinds of dashboards that you can now create because you have all this analytics uh, information, both to, you know, monitor the network health and traffic patterns, but also... Uh, security events. So, for example, you can have, um, if you look at the in the central graph here, you can have thresholds around uh, ACL deny accounts and, and TCP SYN floods. And if an anomaly is detected, your policy engine can can automatically take action um, as predefined by the administrator. Um, this could involve, you know, mirroring traffic to a to a dedicated firewall or just. Uh, quarantining a particular branch location via some routing or redirect policy. So there are a lot of different options um, that now become uh, become possible. Uh, in the in the context of uh, you know SD WAN security, it is also important to mention um, that you know the security elements have to be embedded in each and every node in the network. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, perimeter security is important, uh, but with threats changing and the attacks coming from within. Uh, you also need uh, this, this boundaryless uh, software-defined security capability. And, and that's a little bit of a mouthful, but software-defined security capability, meaning uh, the security policy provisioning is automated and uniformly applied across any domain, any location, uh, any form factor, all the way from servers running in branch locations or data centers to containerized and bare metal uh, workloads uh, running in private or, uh, or public clouds. And finally, you know, going back to what I was talking about earlier in terms of, you know, service assurance and the importance of uh, correlating the underlay to the overlay, um, especially important actually for uh, for the service providers of any size and and even global enterprises that may be managing uh, both the overlay services as well as their dedicated transport networks. Uh, it does not matter whether you own the transport or your service is running over uh, some transport that you've procured from a local service provider. And the important thing is that you should be able to uh, troubleshoot and have those monitoring tools that let you go from and uh, drill down from a service view, correlate the faults that are happening uh, in the underlay back to the, to the overlay. Uh, so hopefully this gives a good summary of what a boundaryless network looks like. Um, let me pause here and uh, uh, next, I wanted to actually share a couple of examples of how some customers have implemented this. But before before I do that, Cliff, I know you had some recent data to share. So let me let me pause here and then hand it back to you. Thank you, Sunit. And um, I would just like to share some data uh, from uh, again uh, a fairly recent survey on what are the key drivers for SD WAN. And you know, if I were to summarize it, uh, no surprise at a marketing level, uh, SD-WAN is wanted for agility, improved performance, and reduced costs. But really, you know, what it, what, when I talk to people, I also get the message that, you know, because SD-WAN offers the possibility of comprehensive and fine-grained understanding of application flows, end users really see a better experience or feel have a better experience. And 
Also, uh, people talk about the policy infrastructure and how that really enables automation across the WAN. And the real important thing there is when you see automation across the WAN is when a link fails, at this point, there's not a human that needs to intervene, which means that the people that are currently uh, using the WAN uh, for applications or voice can actually continue to do what they were doing and in many cases don't even sense that there was a change in the underlying transport infrastructure. There was just an automatic reaction. And so, and we can also look forward to uh, a time when we can see additional services around application visibility and predictive analytics starting to continue to tune the quality of experience. And you can see, if you look at the actual results, you can see that automated WAN link failover and recovery was near the top of the list with 78% of respondents rating that a strong driver. That would be a six or a seven out of seven. So with that, let's take a look at some real success cases that Sunit has for us. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you again, Cliff. Um, I do have a couple of examples here uh, to share, you know, how early adopters have deployed SD-WAN solutions and um, kind of the benefits that they are getting out of it. Uh, the, the first use case on the, uh, on the screen here is the service provider use case. It's a tier one global carrier uh, that has launched um, an uh, SMB VPN, small medium business uh, VPN service using SD-WAN technology. And, and they actually had two goals in mind. You know, one was to reduce the, the site bring up time for this managed service offering uh, for you know, quality of experience uh, reasons. Um, and for the second phase, what they're looking at is to offer new revenue generating services, revenue generating services for the for the service providers themselves, um, such as the ability to have on-demand virtual firewalls uh, from their customer portal. So effectively, you know, they are thinking of having a catalog um, of firewall options from, say, Palo Alto or Fortinet or Checkpoint, whatever is the is the is the enterprise selected uh, firewall option. Uh, that will be available from a catalog, and then the enterprise customers can, can choose from and deploy uh, that particular virtual function onto the branch edge uh, in, a, in a matter of minutes. So this is uh, something that they, they were trying to address, and uh, they launched their service initially over broadband internet as the primary underlay and uh, 4G LTE acting as a, as a backup uplink from the branch locations. And, uh, you know, using the SD-WAN solution, they were able to see almost... Um, you know, 50% reduction in overall OPEX spend compared to how uh, how their traditional VPN services uh, were being offered. Uh, the second use case uh, that I, I wanted to share is uh, is on the enterprise side. This is a global ONG customer, oil and gas uh, customer with locations worldwide, uh, and uh, they need to connect these global remote locations back to their central data center sites. Um, and those data centers, you know, both uh, actually private and private, uh, public cloud-hosted applications. That, that was their use case. Um, and given their global footprint, they needed uh, this VPN network to, to run on a range of transport networks. Uh, so in this case, the problems they were trying to address uh, was, number one, you know, they wanted to reduce the transport costs in some of the regions by using uh, the local carriers versus uh, getting the global VPN service from a uh, from a global service provider, and second, they wanted to ensure that their, you know, their network and security policies are uniformly applied across all of those of those sites. So they uh, they decided to go with um, with our SD-WAN solution that runs over a, a range of transport networks, um, and they actually procure the transport itself from a, a, a broker service or a broker uh, company that that manages uh, transport across different regions. Uh, but effectively, what they've achieved is, you know, over 30% uh, savings compared to their earlier mode of operations. And more importantly for them, they, are, they now have a way to push out the same, you know, security monitoring and sort of compliance uh, policies that are, uh, that are needed for the ONG uh, space to all of their uh, remote locations. Um, and then finally, what I wanted to do today uh, was to highlight, you know, the, the nuage approach to it. So how is Nuage trying to build um, the solution that, that works for this evolving multi-cloud environment? Now, for those of you that are not uh, familiar with Nuage Networks, we are a division of Nokia. Think of us as a, you know, as a Bay Area startup that comes packaged with um, you know, global supply chain and, and support capabilities. 
Um, but from a from a technology perspective, our mission or, or goal is to enable uh, this secure, seamless connectivity for users and applications, uh, independent of their location. You know, from the DC to the branch or campus to extranet partners to public cloud-hosted uh, SaaS applications, all of those, and over any transport, whether it is MPLS networks. Uh, business or even consumer internet, 4G LTE, and in future we are already hearing 5G as well as satellite uh, networks being used, or, or there's a desire to use those as transport. So, so this notion of having that seamless service overlay is what we call boundaryless networking, and that is at the core of what we what we do. Um, we started on this multi-cloud uh, networking capability journey way before the term be became popular, uh, and so the way we've achieved that is by having this common policy or management plane at the, at the top of the slide here, the, uh, the, the virtualized services director node or VSD node. Uh, this is the single interface that any front-end UI or OSS BSS system needs to integrate with. Uh, in production networks, we typically deploy this as a three-node um, HA cluster, and then we'll typically deploy it across multiple data centers for redundancy, uh, redundancy purposes. And northbound, it exposes a very rich and, and, and granular declarative policy uh, language uh, that allows you to configure these service overlays and configure those, uh, you know, those service chains and redirects that we talked about earlier. Uh, the key point here is that unlike most of our competitors, uh, you don't need to manage different systems and interfaces depending on the domain. So, so this single VSD can manage thousands of branch locations as well as endpoints, uh, in data centers as well as endpoints in uh, in public clouds. Uh, BSD, or this virtualized services uh, director node, also has uh, uh, an analytics engine built in uh, that enables all of the security and visibility um, capability that, uh, that you would want in your uh, SDN or SD-WAN or uh, going forward um, SD-IoT kind of solutions. Um, so the next layer down from the VSD is the virtualized uh, uh, services controller. This is the horizontally scalable control pane. Um, this, uh, the important thing to note here is that the Nuage virtualized services controller is built using the same carrier grade uh, SROS that runs on all of our 7750 routing uh, platforms. So it is based on a mature, highly scalable, resilient, you know, feature-rich software stack and it uses standard protocols such as multi-protocol BGP to enable that scale which is needed for uh, uh, for a multi-cloud uh, networking platform that is going to manage thousands or tens of thousands of nodes. And finally, at the bottom, you have the data plane nodes. Um, in the private cloud or data center, the data plane is the software switch that runs uh, within the hypervisor. For the SD-WAN side of the solution, we've taken the same approach and we are running the routing and switching software on a range of uh, branch CPE devices. Uh, these include you know, virtual form factors that run on uh, x86 servers, the network services gateway nodes that run on x86 servers, um, uh, but we also have uh, an equivalent virtualized form factor for the public cloud. So, for example, there is the AWS AMI that, that becomes your uh, branch uh, CPE device for an uh, Amazon VPC. Uh, in addition to that, we have the physical form factors that are targeted for a range of branch sizes from the really small to corporate headquarters. Um, again, the important thing to note here is all of our CPE form factors, all of our CPE devices are based on standard x86-based uh, uh, COTS platforms, so commercial off-the-shelf hardware, and that's how we realize the, those CapEx benefits uh, that come from you know, the economies of scale that x86 ecosystem provides. And that's also the reason why you know our software feature velocity is is uh, is, is really high because we are using this true hardware software uh, disaggregation paradigm. Um, now, using all of those building blocks, you know, at the data plane, at the control plane, at the policy plane, um, what we have built is this SD-WAN solution that provides connectivity and security capability for a range of workloads over any transport network. And this is what I've been talking about, uh, but specific to us, we support 4G LTE, we support MPLS, we support uh, internet connectivity on all of the uplinks. And this is the, the one, uh, I believe, only SD-WAN solution technology that is designed from the ground up to handle 
uh, both L2 and L3 overlay services. And that's important, uh, especially for some of our larger uh, MSO customers. Um, and finally, you know, we've taken a, a platform-centric approach uh, to enabling deployment of a range of third-party virtual functions, uh, both in the data center and the branch edge. Um, so effectively, you can use the same VSD to bring up a virtual function at a branch edge and then service chain certain traffic patterns, certain traffic profiles to go through those virtual functions, whether they're virtual firewalls or van optimization engines, or service chain traffic back through the data center. So overall, you know, a highly scalable and resilient solution um, that has now been deployed, as I mentioned earlier, um, in you know some of the some of the largest uh, global tier one service providers. Um, and so we've seen great market traction with the solution. Uh, but in the interest of time, let me pause here. Uh, if there are more, um, you know, if you're looking for more information, both on the product side from Nuage Networks uh, or some of these customer use cases, you can definitely find it uh, on our website at nuagenetworks.net. Uh, but with that, let me hand it back to you, um, Cliff. I think that's uh, that's all I had. But let me hand it back to you for your final thoughts, and then we can take uh, any questions that may be there. Thanks, Sunit, and. Uh that's good that you mentioned the questions because now is a great time to enter any questions that anyone may have while I just sort of provide a little bit of final thoughts. And so one of the things that I think it's important that everyone take away is that the multi-cloud needs management. And we believe that SD-WAN, as it was originally spec to solve a transport problem, will evolve to become that fabric for the multi-cloud, providing uh, in both connectivity, but also providing that one policy infrastructure uh, rather than many that will be used for delivery of applications across the multi-cloud. We must include security. That needs to be designed in from the, the beginning, not added, bolted on later as many security solutions are. And, and the time is right now for SD-WAN. Uh, I don't think anyone has too many doubts about that. Our forecasts show that. Uh, we have seen successful large-scale deployments that you know, have shown that this works. And uh, the SD-WAN market is definitely primed for rapid growth. And it's actually time to start planning for SD-WAN Plus. And that is looking past such simply solving a transport problem. So with that, I think Joanne wanted to uh, provide a couple of housekeeping items before we jump into questions. Thanks, Cliff. And, and yes, if you want to uh, plot your first question um, with Sunit, that's great. I'm just going to mention to the audience, I know Sunit had mentioned on his last slide that you can uh, visit the New Age uh, 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 website for more information. Just remember, we do have that resource guide. There's a link right in that section where you can um, connect directly with the website. You can also download the slides from today's session and the companion report. So please do uh, check that out if you have not already. And I think, um, Cliff, you have a few questions to start with here. And again, to the audience, just uh, keep your questions coming in. We have a number already in, and we'll keep going to try to answer all of them. So Cliff, yeah, thank back you. to you. Thank you, Joanne. And uh, we actually have a really good one that's always a debate. So the question is really about standards or the concern about lack of SD-WAN standards. Um, and the potential that drives a single vendor solution. And so I guess it's a balance that I've seen between those that believe that uh, standards uh, just slow things down and uh, is software, in a software-defined world, the code is a standard, versus those that believe that standards provide a rationalized market. So I guess, Sunit, uh, are you able to comment on that and give us a viewpoint as well? You know, what are you hearing from your customers when you work with them? Sure, no, that's a, that's a great question. And, and like you said, Cliff, um, for any new technology, there's always this, uh, this uh, tussle between do we wait for all the standards to emerge and, and be solidified, or do we go ahead and uh, implement the solution? And there's always uh, this fine balance that has to be achieved. Uh, let me let me address this question in, in two different parts, right? So there's there's one part uh, which has to do with using standards or um, open um, technologies or open interfaces within the solution, right? So we have the management or policy plane, and we have the control plane, and then 
down south we have x86 based CPU devices. It's it's important as as um, and and this is what we keep hearing from our customers as well. It is important to make sure that the interfaces between those layers are standard based. So. Um, there is nothing proprietary in, in that respect. When I was talking about that horizontally scalable uh, control plane, important to have that standards-based interface among those controllers. So we use multi-protocol BGP, um, and that is the same multi-protocol BGP that actually interfaces back with the PE routers. Another example of um, you know a standard protocol being used within the system would be um, you know, say the, the the JSON APIs or the REST APIs being exposed north, and Open APIs being exposed north of the um, of the the management plane or the VST. Um, so that's important. You know, the internals you should understand and make sure that the internals are standard based. Uh, where at some point, if you want to replace, say, one x86 hardware standard device by another or use the same x86 hardware that you've uh, procured but with a different software solution, though you should be able to do that. that there should be clean APIs and uh, clean standards um, within the solution. So, I, But I think that only answers part of the question. I, the, the question probably, uh, the, the, the person who's asked is probably talking about, you know, how do we make sure that there are uh, interfaces between solutions coming from one vendor to another vendor to another vendor. And we've we've already seen a little bit of traction in that space. So you know we have been in discussions with the the MEF forum as well as the ONUG um, WAN uh, working group. Uh, there there is just as we saw the evolution of say MPLS uh, networks initially. You know individual vendors came in and and brought their solutions, and then standards evolved around that. Uh, I think we will see something similar in this space as well. One of the places where uh, the standards are likely to evolve first um, is probably going to be the interface of the van service to the transport network itself and that's something that the the map forum is uh, is looking at um, and then there are other uh, like i said you know onuk uh, van group is looking at some of these things as well again from our perspective we want to make sure that the internal building blocks are built using standards uh, and standard protocols and when the standards evolve uh, the the different vendor solutions can uh, can interoperate. Well, thank you, Sunit. And uh, I must say that uh, I understand that standards take time, and in today's world, we can't always wait for a standard to move forward. Uh, but ultimately, the market needs a rational perspective. There is another question here that actually is a bit more for me, uh, and that is we're getting a question about uh, VNFs and question is what are some of the most common VNFs deployed and how are they managed and I can tell you that we actually survey that uh, in uh, service providers and what their plans are and the two most common VNFs are VCPE and SD-WAN uh, that service providers plan to deploy. How are they managed? Well today most VNFs if we uh, were are simply virtualized versions of the appliances but moving forward we, we do believe that the majority of the VNFs will be managed using a MANO and then connected directly within to the back-end systems. And in discussions I've had with the SD-WAN vendors of today, uh, many of them are providing their solution which is run over the top to many of their service provider uh, customers or partners. But uh, also the service providers have directly asked those vendors to prepare a VNF that can be integrated in their data centers or run on a UCPE piece of equipment at the customer site and be managed in the background by their OSS BSS systems. And so that, uh, I think, uh, should handle that question. Uh, I have, um, I have if I may, question. If I yeah, if so I may, did you want to add something please. to that? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah no, really quickly, I, I just wanted to um, you know, just second what you said. Um, we've we've seen the you know the virtual function um, management, uh, the the Mano architecture. We we've seen that evolve in the data center, and uh, the desire, as you said, uh, Cliff, is that you know the same constructs, the same sort of APIs, and um, same systems should be able to to manage on the VAN side as well. And that's that's definitely something that we are also hearing. Uh, the one subtle difference we've seen between you know cloud hosted or data center hosted virtual functions versus the uh, the van hosted or cpe device hosted or 
or UCP hosted um, functions is that the you have to you have the, the requirements are slightly different in the sense that you have to deal with the the vagaries of the WAN environment, the insecure WAN environment. So you want to make sure that uh, whatever orchestration system you're using uh, can actually deploy these functions securely over a WAN environment, and then not just deploy it once, uh, but do the health monitoring and upgrades and things like that. Um, you don't have the same elasticity kind of requirements on the WAN side, which you have on the data center side. So typically what we've seen is that customers would want to deploy a firewall or, or a WAN optimization engine as a virtual um, function at the branch edge. Uh, but there is, it's, it, it is not the same level of elasticity that is required. So slightly different requirements, but like you said, the northbound interface is what everybody wants to make sure is is standard because that is what if you if you diverge uh, for your uh, you know van domain from the data center domain that's where you lose a lot of your um, operational benefits okay thanks Shani, for adding that and um i have another question here which maybe you could help us with uh the question really is around the impact of the mpls business for service providers so you, I know uh, at uh, Nuage, you're partnering with a lot of service providers. How are they viewing SD-WAN with respect to their MPLS business? Do they see it as a cannibalization? That's, a, that's, a, that's another great question and, and something that uh, comes up uh, quite frequently um, when I'm on panels and, and at conferences. Uh, what we are so so we as as you mentioned you know we are providing the solution to some of the tier one carriers the BTs the Telefonicas of the world, and what we've seen is uh, a two pronged approach as far as uh, service providers are concerned. You know one of course they do see uh, a little bit of a threat from an over the top solution, so there is that concern around cannibalization, but. Uh, at least in the last few quarters, um, what we've seen is that that really hasn't panned out. What has ha what has really happened is uh, the service providers have used this opportunity to extend into regions and domains and um, and countries where they don't really own the underlay network. So that's one approach that they are taking. Um, the second um, approach, which actually is uh, is probably I think going to be sort of the de facto uh, approach from a service provider perspective, is uh, they do recognize that the MPLS networks provide a certain level of SLAs that business critical applications, your voice over IP traffic, uh, will need. So when we are developing our, or the requirements we are getting from the service provider customers is to make sure that when traffic is sent, that business critical um, traffic is being sent over an MPLS VPN network, it is sent and tagged with the correct parameters that the MPLS network understands and can then guarantee the kind of uh, delay and jitter characteristics that you want for those applications. Uh, what they are actually realizing uh, out of this whole move towards over the top or at the edge uh, application aware routing kind, kind of constructs is uh, it has made the use of MPLS networks much more efficient. Uh, it's definitely not something that's going to lead to the eventual uh, you know, non-existence of MPLS networks. We don't see that happening. Uh, but uh, but where we see the the market moving is you you do start using your MPLS networks uh, in a much more judicious fashion, and that's where you know, the coexistence of SDN or SD WAN and MPLS technologies. Uh. Well, thank you, Sunit, and I would say that uh, matches what we're seeing as well. That we're not seeing any huge drop off in MPLS revenue, and that it's more about uh, making better use of broadband than it is about cannibalizing MPLS uh, from our perspective. Uh, one more question. I think we have time for one more question. And I'd like to circle back on security with you. And so it seems to me that based upon what you said, uh, we see the network itself really in doing a lot more security uh, functions in the future. And that's the place where security becomes embedded. Um, that, uh, that that's that's a you know that's another huge trend that we are seeing. Um, as you know, Nuad started um, four and a half, almost five years uh, back on the on the SDN and the data center space, and we initially started looking at some of the micro segmentation um, uh, solutions focused primarily on the data center. You know, how do you monitor your east-west traffic? And then when we go from there to the SD WAN, and then increasingly to the SD LAN or SD campus, and then in, in not distant future into the IoT space, um, 
it is important to have security front and center. But one of the things that we've realized, or at least from my vantage point that we've seen, is that there is no one-size-fits-all um, kind of a solution as far as security is concerned. Uh, so that perimeter security discussion that we had earlier, I mean, that's important. You know, those, those firewalls in certain lo locations, physical firewalls in most locations, you know, those virtual firewalls um, are, are still important. Um, if I if I look at it broadly, I think there are four different um, sort of uh, dimensions to this whole security discussion. The first one is around having that embedded capability that you talked about, right? Making sure that there are stateful ACLs and uh, you know uh, URL filtering and sort of IDS IPS kind of functionality just embedded in each and every node of the network. Uh, and that's one. The second is for your really small branch locations where you cannot uh, host a virtual firewall or a, or a physical firewall, uh, you want that ability to either send that traffic through some scrubber. For example, Zscaler is a, is a partner of ours. Uh, so there are requirements where you want to send traffic uh, from a branch location through a scrubber because the branch location doesn't have all the, the security appliances or the virtual functions. So that's the second model. Uh, the third is hosting these uh, virtual uh, firewalls or scrubbing services or, or you know, uh, we call them quarantining kind of um, services in your uh, data centers. So that's the third one. And then the last one is having that holistic uh, machine learning AI-like um, uh, security approach where the network is sending you tons and tons of data and there are patterns to that data. And then if there is some anomaly that gets highlighted and not just gets highlighted, it automatically is reacted to, and then you can quarantine that branch location. Um, in fact, in that space, we do have a have a separate product which I didn't talk about on the on the Noad Solutions uh, page. Uh, that is called Virtualized Services or Security Services, which is you know takes all this information coming out of the network um, and then uh, reacts to it from a security or threat monitoring perspective. So, so yes. You know, all of those individual uh, solutions are required, but over over time, the importance of this holistic view that um, that a VSS-like solution provides will become more and more important. Well, thank you, Sunit, and I think we're actually over time. So, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Joanna. I think she may have a closing remark or two, but uh, we're, that concludes the content for today's presentation. Thank you so much, Claire. Yes, thanks. Yep. Thank, thank you, and, and I just want to thank everyone uh, in the audience for your participation on the webinar today. We hope we gave you some solid, actionable intelligence, so thanks for joining us. I also want to thank Cliff for leading our discussion, and uh, Suna and the, the entire team from Nuage Networks for uh, this really very informative discussion today. Um, and for the audience, an archive version of the webinar will be available for you shortly. We'll be sending a follow-up email on how to access the archive, so please watch for that. Uh, you can also use the same audience link that you used to get in today to come back, uh, view the session again, or feel free to share it with your colleagues. You're also going to see a short survey pop up um, at the conclusion here. We'd love to get your feedback, so please take a few moments to fill that out. And also make sure to follow us on Twitter for information on future webinars from the IHS Market Technology Group. Again, thanks everyone for joining us and have a great rest of your day.